Hey guys, so today I wanted to chat about the seven books that I read in February. I know that I am super late to post this. Uh, school was pretty busy. I still managed to read seven books in February, which I'm quite proud of because that's more than I normally managed to read in a month. So if you want to hear my thoughts, let's get started. So the first book that I read in February was actually my favorite read of February, and that's Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik, which I absolutely adored. Spinning Silver is pretty popular and pretty hyped in book communities, but if you haven't heard of it, Spinning Silver is a very wintry, very enchanting reimagining of Rumpelstiltskin, where we follow three main girls, one of whom is the daughter of a moneylender. Her name is Miriam. So Miriam's father is incredibly kind, which makes him a great father, but a pretty terrible moneylender. And so the the, the villagers in the small village that they live in end up taking advantage of him and his kindness and they don't pay back their debts and so basically Miriam and her family end up living in extreme poverty and so um, one of the main girls, Miriam, she basically decides to just take it into her own hands. She steps up and she sets out to collect the debts that are owed to her and her family, ignoring all the excuses that the elder, um, that the other villagers are giving her and so it turns out that she's actually quite a skilled money lender and she keeps at it and eventually earns herself a reputation for being able to change silver into gold, hence spinning silver. And this basically attracts the reputation of the Staric, which is a race of these like magical elfin type creatures that come from a kingdom of ice. And the Staric Lord basically promises Miriam that if she can change silver into gold for him, he's going to come and he's going to take her to into the the icy winter kingdom so i mentioned that there were three main girls so miriam is obviously one of them and then her story is also intertwined with two others wanda and arena and so wanda is also um one of the villagers she just lives just outside of the village where miriam is and she also lives in poverty but instead of having you know a loving father like miriam she has a very abusive father who's alcoholic and she basically raises and protects her two brothers and then we have Irina, who is the daughter of the Duke. And so she comes from obviously a very different background because she comes from a rich and powerful family, but she's very, very much forgotten about in her house and her family because she isn't typically beautiful. Like she doesn't fit into the conventional beauty standards for women. Um, but even so, her father is planning to marry her off to the Tsar, who is himself described to be almost like unnaturally beautiful but he is also unknown to most people very cruel this is definitely um, a bit slower paced and more of a character driven story i found and i thought that the characters were very well done especially the three main girls that we follow i think that as i said they all come from very different backgrounds both financially and in terms of the the life that they live at home um, and so this kind of offers a different perspective on what it's like to be a woman in this in this world so miriam does come from a loving family but lives in extreme poverty uh, wanda as well lives in extreme poverty but she does not come from a loving family she really only has her brothers and then arena comes from a very rich and powerful family but she is she isn't unloved at all but she's just basically kind of there in her house she isn't she's forgotten about um but despite that they all have these different lives they all are very similar in the fact that being a woman in this world they don't really have any agency over their own lives and their own fates especially when it comes to marriage so you get to see how each of these girls draws strength from their experiences and from the hardships that they've faced because of their upbringing and how they kind of use that strength to to take advantage or to take agency back over their own lives and to try to take control of their fate as much as they can. And it's really satisfying to read about. These are strong female characters that are actually strong. And we kind of see how they use that strength in order to stay alive in this world that wants them dead and how to take control over their fates. Speaking of characters, something that I think Spinning Silver does a lot better than Uprooted, which is another standalone fantasy novel by the same author, um, is the development of the side characters. In Uprooted, I found the side characters were really quite flat, whereas in this one, they're a lot more fleshed out. And this is a multi-POV um, book. I think we have six POVs in total. And I found that they all were three-dimensional and more fleshed out. And I also, without getting into any spoilers, I just wanted to touch on the fact that the main antagonist, the villain, seems very, very human in the motivations that drives the character. 
And I'm not going to say anything else. Just believe me on that. Although this is more of a character driven story, I still found the actual story itself to be just so lovely. It was such a beautiful story. It completely captured me. And I think the slower pace really gave time for these characters to shine. And I mentioned that their fates um, of the three main girls are all intertwined. And I found that the way that those their storylines all came together was so satisfying and worked so well and was so beautiful. And there were some obviously really hard topics, especially mostly surrounding Wanda and the alcoholic, abusive, broken home that she comes from. And there were some passages that really had me tearing up, especially regarding how she kind of manages to to get herself away from that and how she she grows beyond that and like learns to trust again it's it's heartbreaking and it's beautiful and it's enchanting but i wouldn't classify this fully as a romance book but there is a slow burn enemies to lovers romance that does take place in this book and it was so cute it made my heart just melt reading it Ugh, it, it made me so happy i don't really read a lot of romance books but i really love romance in my fantasy books and yeah this this one was just it was so good it was so cute i wanted to just quickly talk about the writing as well because I think Naomi Novik has such a way with words that really makes her books, um, this and Upreader are the only ones that I've read, but they both just read so much like fairy tales. And she has just such a way with words that is just so enchanting and captivating. And it really does make you feel like you're transported into this like cold, wintry world, but it's so beautiful at the same time. If I were to recommend one book to read inside, sitting next to the fireplace on a, a cold, winter, snowy night, and you've got the blinds open and a hot chocolate, and you're just reading and, and looking at the snowflakes falling outside while you're warm and cozy, it would be this book. It really, it's just has that vibe of just an enchanting winter fairy tale and i i mean i recommend this at any time but i would definitely recommend this as a winter read overall if you can't tell i adored this book to pieces and i gave it five out of five stars okay so next is the fisherman by john langan which is a cosmic horror novel about some terrifying things that happen at this place called dutchman's creek where basically the the veil that separates our world from the world beneath ours like the universe the not physically beneath, but you know, the, in a cosmic level, um, the veil there is very thin. So, so I actually have the full review of this book up on my channel. Um, I'm going to link that down below in the description if you wanted to check it out, but I'm just going to give my overall thoughts and opinions here. So we follow our main character, Abe, who discovers fishing after the death of his wife. And he basically, he ends up becoming friends with one of his coworkers after his coworker loses his whole family very tragically. And he starts to bring his coworker along fishing with them. And the two of them, after forming a bond and spending all this time fishing together, they end up coming by this Dutchman's Creek because Abe's friend heard about it and wanted to check it out. And they start getting all these warnings from the locals like, no, don't go there. Not even the locals will go there. The only people who go there are tourists and they, you know, they either don't come back or regret coming back or regret going in the first place. And so, you know, despite all these warnings, they're like, no, 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 we're, we're going to go check it out. We're going to go fish there. And at this point, we have a break in the narrative and we cut to have the origin story of Dutchman's Creek. And so this takes about a third of the book. So it's basically a story within a story. So I really love the idea of cosmic horror, but I think it's hard to find novels that actually do it very well and properly like capture that those cosmic elements. Um, and so I was very pleasantly surprised to find The Fisherman because it actually perfectly nailed those cosmic and those eldritch elements. I think that the world building in this was stunning. It was super fascinating and super dark. And this, the idea of this world beyond our world that is just, just underneath ours was so cool. Just the way that it's presented and how we just kind of start seeing glimpse and pieces of it. And then we finally get to spend more time there. But even after that, we see glimpses of more and how it's like a whole functioning world. And that's all we get is just those glimpses. And it, it was really freaking cool, but I wish we got to see more. But I also am glad that we didn't because it adds to that mysterious and like almost unknowable element of cosmic horror where, you know, as a human, you really just can't understand everything that's going on. I love that the goal of this novel and cosmic horror in general isn't to, you know, rid the world of whatever evil or, you know, kill the killer. It's really just to survive until the end and to not lose your mind and not die trying to survive because you can't win against these like eldritch cosmic forces. So The Fisherman is definitely a bit of a slow burn, and I found especially that third in the middle, that flashback to the origin of Dutchman's Creek, it, it did kind of drag on a little bit, but 
it was okay because when we did finally get to the payoff, it was just so good. And the atmosphere that was building throughout the novel was just this sense of dread that was just kind of slowly building and building. And you didn't know where it was going, but you knew it was not right. And then we finally get to the climax and it is wild. When we finally do get to the end, I absolutely did not expect what was coming, but it was so well done and it fit. It fit what was happening so well. And I just, I loved it. And the final third of this book overall was like, so perfectly grotesque and disturbing and the motivations that led us there and got us to that point were just understandable enough to be absolutely heart-wrenching and i'm gonna say like this isn't something that would keep you up at night but it is something that will disturb and it will disturb you because you can sympathize and because you can understand where where these motivations were coming from and what got got us to these points so it was the the way that the eldritch forces and the humanness, human human nature, not humanness. Um, so the way the Eldritch Forces and the just the humanity of this book and how those come together to get us to the end. And that is what thoroughly disturbed me about this book, especially the commentary on grief, because grief is definitely highlighted here and it plays a big role in this book. And we really just see like the depths that somebody is going to sink to while they're in the midst of their grief and what they're going to do to alleviate themselves of that grief. It's horrifying, it's disturbing, and I loved it. I gave it five fish hooks out of five. The next book I read was Witch 13 by Patrick Delaney. This one was actually an arc that I got off of NetGalley. So we follow a small town sheriff on her last night on the force, and basically she just wants to have an uneventful and quiet last night. And of course, that does not happen. Things start to go very, very wrong for them when a witch shows up in their town. And when I say witch, I mean like, yes, with the pointy hat. The entire book takes place over just this one night. And for the most part, it's set inside the police station. There are some parts where they are out in the town, but it's mostly just one night in this police station and our main characters are being tormented by this witch. And they're also cut off from the world outside as there's this horrible storm raging. They can't get help. They can't leave the town. They're trapped with this witch. Uh, it actually reminds me a lot of the movie The Autopsy of Jane Doe, if anyone's seen it, where basically they're just finding like more and more bizarre stuff as the, the night goes on. And it's just it's more and more impossible to explain. And, you know, they're they're trapped there and trying to figure out what's going on while they're being hunted by this witch. So it has a very similar vibe to that. I thought that was a fantastic movie. And if you like that, then you would probably enjoy this book as well. So one thing that I actually really enjoyed about this book was how truly terrifying the witch actually was. So she's described, as I said, as wearing like the pointy hat. And it seems kind of comical almost, you know. Uh, like a witch out of a little a little kid's Halloween storybook, but she's actually terrifying and the forces that she is able to control and the way she manipulates the world and the environment around her makes for some very fun scenes, especially some really fun deaths and just some really like disturbing things that happen. There's this one scene actually near the end where we are able to see just like the full scope of her power and she's just unleashing like death and destruction everywhere. And it was it was so like gory, but so over the top in a way that it was fun to read about and it, it was just it was good so obviously you can tell I liked the story I liked the villain I thought it was a ton of fun but there were some things that I disliked as well most specifically the characterization and the writing I especially felt that the main character she read a little like to not like other girls at times like there's passages where she's described as not liking to eat and not liking to use cell phones and it did end up being explained and there was a reason for it, but it's still just a trope that I don't like to read about. I don't want to hear about girls who are so quirky and different because that's, I don't know, that's not interesting to me. I actually started out not really liking any of the characters, but there were some that grew on me and enough to the point where I found a couple of deaths were genuinely sad. So I think my biggest issue here would have been the writing then. I think for me, the prose was just too simple not to say that i need flowery pose not at all it it was more just that i i noticed that it was simple like i would be reading and then i'd be like huh this prose is just i don't it's just not my thing like it's just very simplistic and it kind of took me out does that make sense also people kept kicking this child so one of the characters brought his child to work and then it, there would be descriptions of like oh they gave him like a friendly kick to the behind and every time i was like why are people kicking this child i have literally never once gave a child a 
friendly kick to the behind. Regardless of what I didn't like, I still enjoyed this overall. I thought it was just, it was just fun. You know, the characters weren't great and I didn't care for the writing that much, but the villain was terrifying and it was just, it was a fun time and it's pretty short. It's very fast paced. So it's a really quick and easy read. And it's something that I would see being a really good horror movie, if that makes sense. Uh, but regardless, I, it's just a super fun, scary read. And I think that this would be something good for like around October. Um, I ended up rating this 3.5 stars out of five. Okay, so next is a horror novella called Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones. And this was really weird and really creepy and unexpected, but it was really good and I liked it. It's really short, so saying too much would give it away, but basically we follow the aftermath of a teen prank gone horribly wrong. So some kids decide to prank their friend who works at the movie theater by dressing up this mannequin that they used to play with and bringing it into the theater with them. And basically at the end of the movie, this mannequin gets up and walks out and then people start dying. And that's all I'm going to say about it because the rest is something you really should experience for yourself if you're interested in this. This is like part coming of age story, part slasher, part psychological horror, 100% creepy and fun and weird and unexpected. And it's overall just a really good time. So this is the second book that I've read by Stephen Graham Jones, uh, the first being The Only Good Indians. And I think that he does a very good job at like getting inside your head and like just making things so that you don't know what's real and what's not and you're constantly questioning like who can i trust here like is the narrator reliable is like is this person reliable and this book is no different i think this book is a very good example of him being able to do that and overall this was really short and it was spooky and creepy and fun and i gave it four stars out of five so the next book i read was another arc and that is they drown our daughters by katrina monroe and Unfortunately, I didn't really care for this. It it wasn't like a bad book by any means, not at all. It just it didn't hold my attention and I found it to be just average. Does that make sense? It wasn't bad. It just it just was. So the main premise is that we are following a family from this small coastal town called Cape Disappointment and the family that is in charge of the lighthouse is cursed. And so basically the, the first woman to live at this lighthouse many, many years, many generations before the, the story takes place, um, she accidentally murders or kills her niece and then her daughter ends up going missing. It's not a spoiler, this is in the prologue, but basically after that happens, every daughter in her family line is cursed to drown. So we essentially kind of follow two stories here. So we have our main character and her daughter back in the present day where she moves back to Cape Disappointment with her daughter after she gets noticed that her wife wants a divorce. And then we also have the story told through multiple generations of all the women in this family line, starting back to the initial woman who have drowned in this cape. Okay, so let's talk about what I did like first. So I thought that the author did a really great job at building up like a very like haunting but beautiful atmosphere so even though most of the book does take place like on a beach in a nice coastal city it still seems very dreary and the way like the beach and the ocean is described is so immersive like I felt like I could feel the salt spray on my skin and like smell the brine and it it was really great and that was phenomenal I also loved how no one could escape the curse like we see throughout the, the stories of all these daughters and even the main the main girl anyone who tries to escape the the cape escape the cape <laughs> um, anyone who basically tries to move away they will eventually find their way back to cape disappointment because they just feel a longing where anywhere else they are it's not home like nowhere feels like home except for this cape so it really does give you the sense that this family is cursed and that nothing like anything that they do to try to get away from it is futile because they're going to find their way back there eventually anyways. That also ties in very well with this book, with the story and with the themes because yearning and longing are such prominent themes in this book that having these characters who just have such a profound longing for home that they always have to come back, it, it, it just makes sense and it fits everything in the book and it was really well done. So now let's move on to what I didn't like so much. So unfortunately, this is definitely a very character driven book but I found that I just didn't really care for the characters. And so I never found myself like wanting to reach for this to pick it up. I just wanted to say they're not poorly written. 
no like nothing in this book I found was poorly written but I just didn't care for the characters and because it was a slower paced more character focused story there wasn't like a thrilling or fast paced plot to fall back on when I didn't care for the characters does that make sense I also found that the main antagonist, for lack of a better word, was so evil, but with no buildup. So it would kind of take me out of the story because I'd be like, why is she just, why is she so evil? And I I understood why she was 100%. And I understand, and I, I mean, I don't doubt that there are people in this world who would be like that, but it just didn't make sense for this particular story because it seemed to come up out of nowhere and there was no buildup, nothing showing that evilness beforehand. Okay, also, this is just a nitpick, and I am well aware that this is just a nitpick, but I'm going to mention it anyways because it's something that took me out of the story every single time. And that's the the phrase, slowly at first, then all at once. The author used this about two or three times in this book, and every single time I read it, all I could think of was the phrase from The Fault in Our Star, The Fault the fault in our stars by john green where he's like i fall in love the way you fall asleep slowly at first and then all at once and i know that john green doesn't have a trademark on that phrase or anything but it's just it's so like well known and every time i read it i just immediately was pulled out of the book and again i'm aware that that's a nitpick that that's a me thing so yeah this was not my favorite book that i read but i do just want to clarify that it's not a bad book by any means it's not it's not poorly written it's just not for me. And I think that people who are fans of more family driven, especially with the focus on like maternal relationships type stories, I think that you could really enjoy this and I would recommend it maybe to check out if you do like that sort of thing. And so for that reason, I gave this three stars out of five. Okay, so next is Stolen Tongues by Felix Blackwell. And interestingly enough, this started as a no sleep story, like the Reddit subreddit no sleep. Um, and then I guess it got picked up and um, published into a full book. I haven't read the the original one on Reddit, but I believe this one has more content and is more fleshed out, but I just thought that was interesting. Anyways, this is a horror story following a couple who go up to one of their parents' cabin up in the Rocky Mountains for a romantic cabin getaway, just the two of them. And then overnight in the cabin, they start to hear a bunch of really strange things. So they're hearing like people yelling and then they start hearing like animals screaming. And then they start to hear like the voices of their loved ones calling out to them for help from the woods, that sort of thing. And then his fiance starts talking in her sleep and he's listening and he realizes that she's not just sleep talking or incoherently babbling, she's answering questions. Specifically, she's answering questions about him, about where they are, where they live. And that's the premise, and it is horrifying. So, okay, this is like paranormal activity with the wife doing like all this creepy stuff in her sleep. But if paranormal activity was actually scary, and it's also really fast paced, which I enjoyed because the author just wastes no time getting to the scary parts. And I really like that because although I do enjoy slow burn horror, Sometimes you're just not in the mood to read 200 plus pages until things start getting scary. And this really delivered on that because just the prologue was horrifying. So the most common complaint I've heard about this is that it drags a lot in the middle and that it's too repetitive and it should be shorter. And I honestly disagreed. So yes, there were times where it, you would think like, okay, they're finally safe. And then you would turn the page and it's nighttime and all this creepy shit's happening again. And you're like, oh god, like when will this end? But in a good way. It didn't feel boring, it felt dreadful. Like I felt so much dread for these characters when all I wanted was them to just be safe. So I thought that really added to the story because it was so like, oh man, like it just, it just keeps going, like these poor people. I'm pretty sure this is also rooted in Indigenous folklore, and there is also um, a lot of Indigenous representation in this book, but I don't think the author himself is Indigenous. That being said, I think personally that it was handled in a respectful way. If you've read this and you disagree, then please feel free to tell me why, because I, I would love to hear it. So although I, overall I did really like this, and yes, I found it to be spooky as all hell, there were some things that I didn't really like, so let's get into that. So the biggest thing for me was that the main character, Felix, was just so inconsistent. So, okay, it would be nighttime and, you know, his fiance is doing all this weird shit in her sleep. And he'd be like, oh, like, this is 
awful. Like this is something is wrong. Something is very wrong. And this is not natural. There is something supernatural happening and we need to do something about it. And then like, you know, he would try to do something about it and then it would come time to talk to whoever. And he'd be like, "Mm, I don't know. Like, is it supernatural though? And like, look, I get it. I get it when you're sleeping or you're trying to sleep and it's two in the morning and you start hearing a creak, creaky noises in your house and you're like ghosts yep it's ghosts and you know nothing convinced you otherwise and then you know you wake up the next day and you're like okay it probably wasn't ghosts it was probably my house creaking but in this instance with the character this is like just bizarre stuff that had been going on like been going on for months and for him to be like i am 100 percent sure that this is not right and then a couple days later be like I don't know. I don't think I believe in the supernatural. I I, I don't know. It it was just all over the place. He also did some very stupid things. Like, okay, there's one part where he goes back to the cabin alone and he stays there overnight alone. And I was like, why would you do this? No one would do this. No sane person would ever do this. This is not how people act. Okay. And my last complaint is that, especially towards the end, you know, the they would be like, oh, like we're in serious danger. We need to do something about this ASAP. Like we're going to die. And then the next chapter would be like five days later. And I was like, how were you safe for five nights? Like you were literally just talking about how you're in serious danger. And yes, it did seem like that. And now it's five nights later and you were safe for five nights. I, I don't understand. Anyways, despite all of that, I actually did give this four stars out of five. And that's because it achieved what it wanted to achieve. And that was to scare. This book was genuinely creepy. I think it's one of the creepiest horror novels that I've ever read personally. And, you know, there are just some descriptions that are going to stick with me forever. Some some just vivid, vivid descriptions of like the way his fiance is acting at night are engraved into my brain. And I will honestly probably never stay in a cabin in the mountain in winter or summer because of this book. Okay, so the final book that I read in February was The Traveling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arikawa. And oh my god, when I tell you I sobbed. This book was so outside of my usual genre, but it was so good and I recommend this to everybody. Okay, so The Traveling Cat Chronicles is told from the perspective of a cat named Nena, and he is so named because that's the Japanese word for seven and his tail is crooked and it looks like a seven. And so Nena is a stray cat and he basically forms a tentative friendship with this guy Satoru because Satoru leaves food out for Nana and then and this isn't a spoiler this is the premise it's the very beginning of the book um and then Nana ends up getting hit by a car and so being astray not knowing what to do he drags himself over to where Satoru normally leaves him food in the hopes that Satoru will will take care of him and he does he comes out and he sees Nana and he takes him to the vet and then you know he nurses him back to health and he ends up adopting Nana and that is the start of a beautiful human feline friendship so the story set a few years later than that and basically we're following Satoru and Nana as they're traveling across Japan because Satoru is trying to find someone to take Nana from him and even though he loves Nana very dearly he is no longer able to care for him and this, these are for reasons that we don't yet know um, and so we're basically following him as he re- reminisces with the past people from his life as he drives to see if they're able to take his cat. That's the basic premise but it is so much more than that. We follow Satoru growing up basically as he kind of reminisces with people that he knew at different stages in his life so we see all these flashbacks of him and the times that they had together and it's heartbreaking and heartwarming and beautiful all at the same time so reading from the perspective of nana was really unique and it was also surprisingly really well done so i have owned many many cats in my life and i don't know how the author did it but they managed to perfectly perfectly like describe exactly how a cat would be thinking if a cat was had a pov it would be this cat i don't know how it was so well done so i think the characters are really what shine in this book and that's because they're just so stunningly human so satoru himself is somebody that i think we should all strive to be like he is kind and he's loyal and he's selfless and doesn't really let anything get him down and you know, 
will be kind to anybody no matter what. But that's not how everybody is. That's not realistic, of course. And so we see realistic portrayals of people. We see the beautiful side of people as well as the ugly side of people. We see jealousy and bitterness from people that were his close friends and close contacts growing up. We also see that life isn't fair and that horrible things can happen to the people who least deserve them and to the people who are bright and good. And honestly, it sucks, but that's life. That's real. I will say that the ending is predictable, but honestly, it doesn't matter because that's not what this book is about. This book is about the journey, not the destination. And it just, that that journey made me feel so many emotions. I, I laughed. I happy cried. I ugly cried. I sobbed. It was just so good. And yeah, overall, I loved it. I truly recommend this to everybody. Okay, so that's my February wrap up. Thank you so much for watching. If you've read any of these, please leave me a comment down below. I'd love to know your thoughts on them. If you haven't, then just let me know what you read this February. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Bye!